FMCW radars change their transmit frequency over time to determine the range of targets, which has some benefits over a single tone pulsed waveform because we can detect short ranges with extremely fine resolution. Now, if you need a refresher on these basics, head back to the previous videos in this series that cover the FMCW range equation, beat frequency, frequency modulation, the Fourier transform, and even more. This method is great and all for stationary targets, but what if this is something like an automotive radar where many of your targets are moving? Well, that would introduce a Doppler frequency shift. This is where an electromagnetic wave's frequency is influenced by the velocity of the emitting object, like how a train's horn seemingly changes pitch as it passes you. So if we take this into account, the frequency over time is no longer just shifted by some time, but it's also shifted down or up depending on the direction of the velocity. So at any given point in time now, the received frequency is a function of not only the range of the target, but also its velocity. It now becomes unclear how much of the beat frequency is due to the target's range and how much it's due to its velocity. So we need a better way to differentiate between the two. In this video, I'll introduce two ways, and be sure to check out the description for a Python notebook where you can follow along and play around with these concepts yourself. In my previous video on this topic, we've talked about the sawtooth modulation technique where this is its frequency over time and this is its amplitude over time, but let's try out triangular modulation. Now these first few steps will look exactly the same as what we did with the sawtooth modulation, but then we'll see what new information adding this down ramp affords us. So consider what a target's frequency over time would look like if it had some non-zero range and velocity. First, the range would shift the frequency plot to the right by the amount of time it takes for the signal to propagate and return. This time shift creates a difference in frequency at any given point along this ramp known as the beat frequency, or f-beat. Again, so far this is the exact same as what we talked about in the previous videos with the sawtooth modulation. But then, due to the target's velocity, it would be shifted down if the target is moving away from the radar, and up if the target is moving towards the radar. And this shift is known as the Doppler frequency, or FD. Remember that once we receive the reflection from the target, we then take these two signals and send them through a mixer to get the difference of the two. And here's where it gets really interesting, so let's plot that. Now for this first section, where the RX frequency plot is below the TX, the difference is the frequency from the horizontal shift minus the frequency from the vertical shift or in other words, the beat frequency minus the Doppler frequency. Okay, then there's this little transition period where the difference drops to zero while the two plots cross, and then we have the section where Rx is above Tx, and this is made up of the horizontal shift and the vertical shift, or the beat frequency plus the Doppler frequency. Now, we'll call these two frequency differences F up and F down, because the up section is ramping up and the down section is ramping down. If we were instead back doing the sawtooth modulation technique, we wouldn't get this F down information at all. So this is really cool because where we previously had two unknowns and only one known frequency shift, now we have two values to compute the two unknowns. We can then simply sum F up and F down and divide by two to get the beat frequency. And then we can also subtract F up from F down and divide by two to get the Doppler frequency. All we have to do is wait for a full period of this triangular function to get enough information. So here we have equations for the Doppler frequency and the range beat frequency. We can then take these and plug them into the Doppler velocity equation and FMCW range equation to get information about how fast this target is moving and its distance from the radar. Unfortunately, there is a problem with this though. A radar's antenna can't look at one individual target. It has some beam width, so what if multiple targets are enclosed in this beam width? With one target we had two unknowns, beat frequency and Doppler frequency, and two known values, f up and f down. But if we start introducing new targets, we'll have four unknowns for two targets, six unknowns for three targets, and so forth. So we could just keep increasing the number of known values by changing these ramp rates for every expected target, but this gets out of hand pretty quick. I mean, think of how many cars your car's radar may need to track at one time, not to mention the guardrails, pedestrians, etc. So how do we solve this problem? Well, from the previous videos, we already know how to create a map of targets over range, so ideally we could take this and find the velocities of targets in each of those ranges. 
And since our range resolution could include multiple targets, we need a spectrum of velocities at each range. So this goes from a one-dimensional range spectrum to a two-dimensional range and velocity spectrum, or range Doppler spectrum. Now, before I get into this implementation, when I was originally trying to learn this to implement on some hardware, I seriously read and reread the textbook pages 20 times trying to figure out what was going on. So I will walk through this next section pretty slowly and use mostly visuals instead of throwing a bunch of equations at you. Once you've watched the visual explanation, I highly recommend you go to the description where you'll find some code to mess around with this yourself, right in the browser, so no need to have Python set up on your computer. It also includes more in-depth equations and a challenge problem at the end to solve yourself. Leave a comment if you find a solution. Okay, so as a refresher, we have our transmit signal, then the signal that we receive after it's reflected, and then we take those and put them through a mixer to get the intermediate frequency that contains our beat signal and a larger frequency term. We then pass it through a low pass filter and get our isolated beat signal. Now, up to this point, I've kind of been ignoring some component of this signal, the phase. If we just have one signal, it's completely fine to ignore because a single phase value doesn't mean much. It really just shifts the sine wave in time, but doesn't change any other characteristic. It starts to matter when we have another phase value to compare it to. Like say, if we had multiple of these signals over time, we could see the phase delta between each one. But what is this phase delta actually though? Well, if our target is stationary and we take a measurement, then wait for the FMCW ramp time to finish and take another measurement, we'll get back two equivalent signals and that phase delta will be zero. But it gets more interesting if the target is moving. And this may be more clear if we take a look at an actual system. So let's pull in the AWR1642, which is an integrated automotive radar chip from Texas Instruments. Not sponsored by the way, just a really cool chip. This thing can transmit a signal centered around 76 to 81 gigahertz. For this, I'll pick 77 gigahertz. Then it can ramp over large bandwidths over a chirp time. For this, I'll choose 1.6 gigahertz over 40 microseconds. Don't forget that you can play around with these values in the notebook in the description. So going back to the measurement scene, if your car is coming towards someone 20 meters away at 10 meters per second, you definitely want your car to notice because in only two seconds, you can hit this person and do some serious damage. But if we take a measurement, find the person's distance, and then take another measurement at the next ramp, which is 40 microseconds later, even though you're heading towards this person at dangerous speeds, the distance it traveled in 40 microseconds is only 0 0.0004 meters. And given that the system's bandwidth is 1.6 gigahertz, the range resolution would be more than 200 times larger than this range shift. So we can't detect this difference at all. Luckily, phase is much more sensitive to change. So let's try using that instead. The equation for phase due to a moving target is kind of long and consists of five main components. Like I mentioned, the phase is only valuable when you compare it to something else, so we compare the phase to the previous chirp's phase to get a phase delta, measured in radians. The first component is a function of the change in range between samples, which, as we just found, is really small and comes out to be about 0.027 radians. Here I have that plotted along the unit circle where pi is roughly 3.14 radians. The second is the chirp rate over the time shift, which is even smaller, on the order of 10 to the negative 10th radians. And then the third takes into account the target distance and velocity and comes out to be pretty tiny as well. Now, the fourth is the most interesting because it's directly proportional to the target's change in return time due to velocity, and it comes out to about 1.3 radians, by far the largest of the previous three. Because of this, we can approximate that the phase delta is equal to the 2 pi times the radar's frequency times the time shift from chirp to chirp due to the velocity. And if you want to dive into this equation more, you can check out the notebook in the description. Okay, so from the same chirp, let's assume we have three targets in the scene, and two of them are at the same range with different velocities, and the other is at a different range. So that means we get three sinusoids with two unique beat frequencies and three unique relative phases. We can then sample this and get a one-dimensional set of data where the difference between samples is our system's sampling period, Ts. Then if we wanted to compare targets phases from chirp to chirp, 
we could transmit more chirps and take another set of measurements. That means that this difference between the y-axis samples will be the chirp time, or TC. And this is a super common data arrangement you'll see in range Doppler processing, where the x-axis is called the fast time axis, and the y-axis is called the slow time axis, since the sampling frequency, TS, is much faster than the chirping frequency, TC. So what's interesting about this? Well, if we go through each of these rows or along the fast time axis and take the Fourier transform, we get what you would expect, a bunch of range FFT spectrums like we found in the previous video. And even though these targets are moving, like we found before, the difference in range is tiny, so they look the same except for maybe some differences in magnitude due to the two targets at the same range having differing phases, which will cause some amount of constructive or destructive interference. But the individual phases between chirps is not the same for all these targets. So let's single out one of these peaks and show its phase over the slow time axis. For the peak at chirp 2, if we just had one target, its phase would be the first chirp's phase, plus the phase delta, and then chirp 3's peak phase is chirp 2's peak phase, plus the phase delta, and so forth. And we are so close to finding the velocity spectrum for each of these peaks, so stick around with me for a second while it gets a little more complicated. I promise the solution will be really cool. Now, as we go along the slow time axis, looking at phase, you could say that if the target is moving at a constant velocity between chirps, this phase delta will not change, so an equation for the phase at one of these slow time indices, which we'll say is m, would be phi m is equal to the starting phase plus m times the phase delta, right? And really, the starting phase could be anything, so let's say it's zero and plot the phase over the slow time axis. Here we have the unit circle again, so if the phase delta we approximated is 1.3 radians, each m index of the slow time axis would jump around the unit circle by about this much. Now, if you think about a sine wave, it's really also just phase changing over time. So if we were to plot this changing phase over the slow time axis with rectangular coordinates, it would just look like a sine wave, right? And depending on how fast the phase goes around the unit circle determines the sine wave's frequency. So the sine wave's frequency depends on the phase delta between chirps, which itself is a function of the time delta due to velocity, which of course is a function of velocity. And just to show this off, if we had a target with a velocity that caused a phase delta of 2.6 radians instead of that 1.3, the resulting sine wave would look like this, double the frequency. And this is a super huge discovery, because if we know that the phase along the slow time axis also just looks like a collection of sine waves, we could take the Fourier transform along the y-axis and find where the peaks occur. So let's do that. Here we have the FFT along the slow time axis at the peak that consists of two different targets. Since there's two targets traveling at two different speeds, we actually get two peaks in the velocity spectrum. Each of these peaks are then a function of how fast and in what direction of the phase is going around the unit circle, or how large that phase delta is between chirps, which again is a function of velocity. Insanely cool, right? Now, here's the awesome solution that I mentioned earlier. We can literally just take a normal set of samples over a chirp time, then repeat that over a number of chirps to get what we call a coherent processing interval, and then take the two-dimensional Fourier transform, which first computes the FFT over the rows, and then over the columns. That'll then give us an output where the x-axis is range and the y-axis is velocity. And this just comes out to be a few lines of Python code to do all this complicated math. So let's go back into our example system and make this a little more concrete. Again, we have the same radar chip that's operating at a center frequency of 77 gigahertz with a bandwidth of 1.6 gigahertz over a chirp time of 40 microseconds. And here's what that chirp would look like. To get the slow time axis, we'll repeat this chirp m times. And choosing this m is a trade-off between how long it takes to get a measurement so the higher m is, the longer it'll take to get a measurement, and how fine your velocity resolution is, which is equal to the wavelength divided by 2 times m times the chirp time. For this, I'll choose m equals 40 to get a velocity resolution of 1.2 meters per second, but you could play around with this yourself. Now this would mean that we can differentiate between targets if they're traveling at speeds that differ by at least 1.2 meters per second. So then here we have this collection of chirps that again is called the Coherent Processing Interval, or CPI. Also, while we're at it, we can find the maximum velocity that we can detect for our system 
which is a function of the chirp time of this waveform, and it comes out to 24.3 meters per second. So say we have three targets, one 20 meters from the radar traveling at 10 meters per second, one 20 meters away from the radar traveling at negative 10 meters per second, and one at five meters away traveling at five meters per second. With just the range FFT spectrum, we wouldn't be able to differentiate between these two because they're at the same range, but now we have more information. So here we have M length N signals. Well, really this should be 40 because we set M equal to 40, but that'd be a little too messy to show here, so I'm just putting six. Here, the chirp to chirp waveforms look pretty different because now we have three sinusoids contributing to this, and they each have their own phases and two unique beep frequencies. But let's find some targets in these waveforms. To take the two-dimensional Fourier transform, we first take the Fourier transform along the rows. And then we take that and take the Fourier transform along the columns, and out comes the range Doppler spectrum. And then if we want to find the targets, we can trace along the x-axis to find the target's range, and the y-axis to find its velocity. Wherever we have a hotspot, we know that there's a target corresponding to that range velocity pair. And here we can see that there's three hotspots in this plot, meaning that we have successfully detected our three targets. You could even take this and plot it in three dimensions as a surface, which in my opinion looks even cooler and might make it more obvious where the targets are. From here, you could then apply something like CIFAR to discriminate between the targets and the noise, which I covered in the last video, or move on to other processing techniques. Now, there was a lot of content in this video, so I'd highly recommend checking out the Python notebook in the description, which opens right in your browser, and there you can play around with all that I covered in this video, and you could even try out the challenge problem that I added. Thank you all so much for watching. I'd really appreciate it if you subscribed, if you learned something, or enjoyed the video. As always, you can check out the description for resources, caveats, and all the source code used to make this video. Let me know in the comments what you'd like me to cover next. Thanks for watching.